Bonjour and uh, good morning. Uh, some technical reasons. I ha I'm told I have to sit here, so um, we'll have to make do. The second is I might actually. Um, I'm hoping that my voice uh, would hold up. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, Nick McClellan can finish off the talk. He knows as much about this than I do. Uh, I've uh, been uh, trying to uh, protect my voice for today. Um, just uh, before I get into the discussion, um, you know, it feels a bit like, uh, imagine a, a, a dance hall in a village somewhere, and there's a beautiful girl there with lots of uh, blokes uh, seeking her attention. Uh, the Pacific is a bit like that at the moment. Um, everyone is uh, trying to um, to attract the most uh, beautiful girl in the dance hall. Uh, so first, uh, New Zealand uh, announced their step up, I think, and uh, then uh, Australia uh, and the U.S. and you know. Uh, so in a way, it's uh, nice to be uh, uh, wanted, nice to be loved, um, because, you know, the history of the Pacific has been uh, one of uh, benign neglect and then followed by periods of intense uh, interest from outside the region. Uh, and I'm sure in your discussions over the next few days, you'll, you'll look at that. It's a good thing. But it, it comes with its own uh, challenges. Uh, and I'll mention a little bit, although I won't be addressing those issues uh, directly as such. Um, I guess it goes to the question of uh, who drives the agenda, which is essentially uh, my presentation uh, this morning. It's an interesting uh, question, who drives the agenda? And obviously, it, it's uh, not straightforward, uh, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, the other thing that happened is the SBC, uh, last week we had our annual uh, board meeting, if you like to keep it simple, followed by a ministerial meeting where they appointed the new director general to replace me uh, later this year. And for the first time in quite a long time, they've appointed a gentleman from Australia. Uh, the SBC has uh, traditionally been led, for the longest time, being led by someone from the region. And that has uh, um, led to quite a, an interesting uh, set of uh, exchanges on Facebook uh, and social media, whatever your um, uh, preference is uh, as to whether, in fact, uh, we are going back to the colonial days and uh, the Pacific, uh, uh, why, why has this happened? Again, I, um, I, I, you know, the members of SPC has made that decision and, and we've got to kind of work with it, but it, it's an interesting uh, point uh, for the region uh, going forward. For now, though, I um, I want to use the short time that I have. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the region, so I'll, I'll just I need to talk a little bit so we can have a, a, a context uh, to discuss the issues. Um, and that's uh, <coughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the Pacific and um, and the significant challenges that we face. My presentation is on self-determination and development. I will focus on development because that's what I know. Um, and the big question is uh, who's driving the agenda? I have decided to speak about SBC because SBC is actually quite an interesting uh, uh, situation. Uh, it's been around 72 years. Um, and the way it's uh, governed and funded uh, illustrates the challenges we have around who drives the agenda for development in this region. So I'll focus uh, quite a bit on SBC. 
Uh, many of you would know that uh, the Pacific is this big blue, and within it we have independent states and several uh, non-independent states, uh, territories of, of the US and France. And for us at SBC, we don't differentiate uh, between who is uh, totally independent and who is not. So New Caledonia, for example, is a full member of SPC, and they have a vote alongside France. The same with Guam and the US. So we don't, we're technical and we don't uh, have any um, limitations on uh, who, who can benefit and who can participate. The, the question, of course, is what is the most appropriate um, approach to development in our region? What is the most appropriate economic model that is appropriate for our region? You see, we've been uh, pursuing uh, neoliberal policies for the longest time, even though there are a number of people around the world who have described the shortcomings of neoliberalism. And if you think about that in the context of the Pacific, it's particularly challenging. Uh, I read an article by Stiglitz uh, back in May where he claims that neoliberalism should in fact be certified dead and buried. Um, but you know, in our region, it's the... A philosophy that drives pretty much what we do. And it's not, I think, uh, one of uh, determination by the Pacific Island states. In a sense, it's imposed by those who pay the piper. Uh, and, and there's dominant, dominant neoliberal ideology in all of the work that we do in the region with its uh, serious shortcomings. Uh, and we can speak about that. As I say, Stiglitz call it a spectacular failure. And yet we're still pursuing free market policies in the development agenda around the region. Uh, and I wonder whether, in fact, there is an alternative. Uh, we are discussing uh, this with uh, the Secretary General of the Forum. Um, do we have a compelling and viable alternative? And if so, what is it? That's the question. And I would just draw your attention to a very interesting development in my other home country, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where they produced uh, the very first uh, uh, well-being budget. And it's interesting, uh, I used to work for the New Zealand government in Wellington. This budget just announced uh, has allocated a, I was going to say a shitload of money, but I shouldn't use language like that, uh, a lot of money to the education, the health, the language, the issues of Pacific people. This has never happened, never in my time, nearly 30 years working for the New Zealand government. I've never seen it. We might get a little bit of money here and there. But this was a very serious allocation of money to the Pacific people who call New Zealand home, and indeed, of course, to the needs of the indigenous uh, population of that country. Uh, and, and I think it's an interesting uh, development. Uh, just to um, go back, uh, as I say, to the, the background, I call it tuna and tourism because uh, they're really the, do, the two big economic uh, drivers in our region. Um, <coughs> tuna, um, the take uh, most recently was uh, six billion US dollars worth of tuna was taken out of the central and western Pacific. You know, it's a serious amount of money. Um, in uh, 2010, we used to get about 60 million back to the islands. And through the efforts of the Foreign Fisheries Agency, parties to the Nauru Agreement, the Tuna Commission, that's progressively increased, and the latest estimate that I've been told is about $500 million have come back to the Pacific. And if you think that that's a fair return, uh, I would uh, seriously question your judgment about fairness, because this is the thing that concerns us in the region. Yes, it's getting better, but it's still a very small fraction of uh, the tick. And the tuna, as you know, is a very important resource 
for our region. The other big one is uh, tourism, uh, generating about uh, four billion and uh, and uh, providing two hundred thousand uh, jobs. Um, deep sea mining or deep sea minerals has attracted a lot of interest around the region, and I must say, people. Uh, perhaps a, a little optimistic about what deep sea mining might pre present for the region. And some countries are progressing uh, quite rapidly. Our work at SPC is simply one of assessment uh, uh, of the feasibility of this, the risks associated with it, funding models, regulatory requirements, and so on. The mining decisions, of course, rests uh, with the country. Um, and, and then, of course, there's a whole lot of other um, uh, potential economic activity around the region. But I suppose the big one for us at the moment is the fact that the Pacific is seriously under threat uh, from pollution, from overfishing, from uh, IUU, illegal, unregulated, unreported uh, fishing, habitat uh, destruction, climate change, and so on. It's a region of contrast, and I'm sure many of you would be aware of this. Five countries in Melanesia alone contribute 90% of the population. And whilst there are lots and lots of islands in the region, um, the uh, Melanesian countries really dominate the development uh, challenges uh, for us. Um, just... Uh, um, it has uh, the Melanesian nations, of course, has the most potential uh, for development, but they are also uh, among the most challenged in terms of uh, capacity and uh, capability. Um, the Micronesian uh, countries face uh, a, a real challenge in 2023 when uh, Uncle Sam changes the rules and we've been engaged with them uh, in more recent times to help them with their education, their statistical, uh, agricultural, fishing uh, capabilities. Uh, but, but they have some serious uh, challenges up, uh, up in the north. Um, just to remind us, uh, again, uh, as I said, most of the population is in... Um, in the Melanesian nations, I've just shared this uh, with you. By the way, life expectancy in our region is in many of the islands in our region uh, is either static or declining. And we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but I've put up here uh, some uh, indicators. Uh, maternal mortality continues to be a huge, huge problem in uh, Melanesia, particularly Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And this has to be uh, one of the most serious concerns that we should address uh, as a region. It, it, it is simply unacceptable, in my view, for women to be dying in what is essentially a normal, natural process of giving birth. But it, it, it doesn't yet attract, it doesn't yet receive the attention that it, it uh, deserves. And, and you'll have your own uh, views about that. Uh, I've just used that as, a, as an example. Um, uh, Micronesia, um, their life expectancy is actually amongst the lowest in the region. Um, we think mainly related to NCDs. Um, and the same in, uh, in uh, Polynesia, although it's a, a little bit uh, better. Um, The, on the on the positive side, uh, infant mortality, deaths before age uh, one year, and deaths under five, has dem declined dramatically across the entire Pacific in the last twenty years. This is SBC work that we can verify and uh, defend. So, as I say, the good news is that there are significant improvements in the mortality rates, or reduction rather, in mortality rates in children and in young people in the last uh, two decades. This is some figures uh, from Fiji. On the other end, uh, life expectancy in Fiji, the Fijians were, have challenged us on this. They don't like it. They say it's not correct. 
But we think that life expectancy in Fiji has plateaued for men uh, in the mid 60s and for women uh, uh, in the low in the 70s. Uh, but this is a pattern that's uh, occurring right around the Pacific. Nauru, of course, is the classic where life expectancy really is only around the mid 50s and declining. <coughs> Even if you look at Papua New Guinea, child mortality, infant mortality rates have come down. But life expectancy there, again, is uh, plateauing, uh, possibly uh, declining. And we think that this is, for the most part, related to uh, non-communicable diseases, the emergence of diabetes, heart disease, and conditions related to changes in the dietary patterns around the region. So climate change and NCDs are two of our biggest uh, challenges, and they are connected. Uh, in going back to the issue of development, remember, we're dealing with some very small islands. Tuvalu, for example, eight islands, total 26 square kilometers. Who in their right mind would want to develop a serious economic development proposal for a country like uh, Tuvalu? This blind pursuit of economic development promoted by funders and international finance institutions is it really the most appropriate thing we can support and offer to Tuvalu? Nauru, 21 square kilometers. So we're talking about some very small places. And as I say, we need to reflect on the wisdom of some of the economic activities that we're promoting in these countries. So I've talked, uh, uh, I made mention already of uh, climate change and environmental sustainability. I'll come back to that in a minute. The uh, other big ones, of course, uh, population growth, particularly in certain spots around the region, South Tarawa and uh, Kiribati comes to mind, Ibai in uh, the Marshall Islands, very concentrated populations in very small areas. And the, and the youth bulge uh, will be familiar to you. The big problem here, of course, is the young people um, are not in education, not in training, and very limited prospects for employment. So youth unemployment is a major, major challenge for us in our region. Uh, politically, you know, people talk about the Pacific as if it's this one united, big, happy family. Um, let me say to you that it is not. We bind together quite well when it, there is a common threat like climate change. And I do think that the Pacific leaders have done a tremendous job in advocating for global attention on climate change globally. But there are not many things that uh, the region uh, combines well on. It's actually quite a, um, an uncertain, it's conditional um, collectivity. It depends on the issue. And for a time, we had the emergence of subgroupings like the Melanesian Spearhead Group, the Polynesian Leaders Group. And so the region is really in the state of flux, I think. It's hard to say quite where all that uh, will go. I'll talk a bit about the economic uh, challenges in a minute. When people talk about climate change in our region, they think of dramatic cyclones. Um, and yes... It is a concern, and yes, it damages uh, uh, the, the islands, it damages the infrastructure, and it puts people at risk. But actually, the big risk in my mind from climate change in this region is coral bleaching and sea level rise. You see, Pacific Island communities, 80% of their protein source come from the sea. Uh, there aren't many other choices other than imported cheap cuts of meat, and therein lies another story. But if you come back to the natural state, people in the region rely heavily on the sea, on fish and seafood. 
And when coral dies from uh, warm sea temperatures and ocean acidification, you're disrupting the food chain uh, and you're putting uh, and communities around the region uh, at serious risk in terms of their food security issues. So when next time people talk about cyclones, of course it's important and of course it's a worry, but um, Actually, I think uh, the less uh, visible, the less uh, dramatic issues like uh, uh, warming sea temperatures and ocean acidification cause us more concern, uh, are equally um, um, concern. You know about the problems we have getting from places, air transportation is unreliable, expensive and infrequent. So distance to markets, uh, again, will be familiar to you. The other big one is uh, where all of much, pretty much all of the islands, uh, three quarters of the deaths uh, in the islands are due to diabetes, heart disease. And even in Papua New Guinea, you're talking about 60% of the deaths. It's not malaria and TB and infectious diseases. It's actually NCDs, diabetes, heart disease, and so on, right across the Pacific. It's one of our biggest uh, uh, challenges. We'll come back to that in, later. Uh, the clearly social uh, challenges, uh, gradual ero erosion of traditional ways of life and monetization of some of the most basic uh, community activities. It's one of uh, the most shameful parts of our region and that is the fact that the prevalence of violence against women and girls is amongst the highest in the world and continues pretty much unabated. Despite the rhetoric, despite the political speeches, we are making no progress on reducing violence against women and girls. Economic challenges, um, there, uh, there's some serious questions about governments propping up unprofitable um, businesses, but anyhow, that's the part of the story of our region. And then, um, as I say, the global influences which really have a major, major impact on what we do in this region. Who drives the agenda? The Pacific is now a very crowded development space. Plenty of international organizations and various agencies who want to do good things in our region discoordinated, unplanned, and actually um, it's a competition often for resources from a very small um, pool of donors. So when people say the UN is a major contributor to this region, yes they are, but they're also a competition for regional organizations like mine because we pretty much go to Canberra, to Wellington, for this to, to try and attract resources from the same limited pool of resources. Climate change and natural disasters I've talked about. Um, I've talked about the NCD, diabetes, heart disease, syndemic. This is a new word to me. Uh, apparently it, uh, it's uh, more serious than an epidemic. Uh, I, I've never heard of it. And I already made mention of my own um, concerns about the continued pursuit of neoliberal policies for development in our region uh, when people know already a lot about the shortcomings. Um, our region is amongst the most uh, uh, vulnerable. You may already be aware the World Economic Forum reports uh, in the last few years puts uh, Tonga, uh, Vanuatu as the most vulnerable and Tonga uh, and there are five of the 10 top most vulnerable countries in the world are from the Pacific, where there are high levels of society vulnerabilities, limited uh, adaptive capacity, limited resources, and uh, technical uh, capacity. Uh, one of the, the examples I'll talk about later is water. It's extremely difficult to access clean water in our region, particularly in the outer islands. And uh, we at SPC spend a lot of time and effort working with communities to try to improve access to clean water. 
but I'll come back to that in a minute. It is one of the ongoing problems we have. And increasingly, of course, with uh, the, the challenges associated with uh, waste management. I don't think that small islands of the Pacific was ever intended to be re to receive uh, plain loads of uh, of uh, tourists. Uh, it's a it's a most uh, unnatural phenomenon, and and now many islands are, are are struggling to know what to do with their waste. It's increasingly a problem in our region, small island states with waste generated by lots and lots of people who come to the islands. And it will, and it is already a major challenge for our colleagues at uh, SPREP in Apia in terms of working with the, the small island states uh, to, to dispose of uh, waste. But above all, the problem in our region is the failure in the education system. We at SPC monitor and report on progress in education in primary schools. In 2015, year four girls did about the same as year six boys in literacy and numeracy. And this is a concern for us. You can't talk about development or sensible development if you don't have a well-educated population. And we are and we remain um, behind the eight ball when it comes to effective education. Uh, we're, we've, we've just done the repeat of Pilna. Pilna is the Pacific Islands Literacy and Numeracy Assessment. Uh, the team at SPC did uh, the repeat in 2018 and we're looking forward to the results in July. So hopefully we have some good news uh, to share. Uh, I'll skip the um, these ones and, and just go to, to Tuna again. I've already talked about coastal fisheries being the primary source of um, um, protein for many of our island uh, communities. And tuna is a major economic uh, activity. Um, in the uh, Pacific, it is one of the examples where I think we're making progress. The Pacific Island nations have come together quite well and agreed on a management plan for the tuna fisheries in our region. It is one of the good news bits that I wanted to share with you. Um, today. So um, I want to just spend the last uh, little while because I want to leave some time for discussion to talk about SPC. SPC was set up in 1947, so we've been around a long time. Um, it is the largest and the oldest of the regional organizations, um, and uh, we are scattered right around the Pacific. Uh, we have a budget of about 100 million, just over 100 million euro annually, 600 odd stuff, uh, mainly around the provision of science and technical advice um, to members, as well as a limited amount of uh, what uh, of public good science outputs that we, we're not a university. So as you can imagine, the team are busy working with the countries. They do generate quite a lot of uh, primary research. Uh, some of it gets into the peer review literature, but it's uh, most of our work is dedicated uh, towards um, supporting the island members with whatever issues that um, that they have. Um, Eighty to ninety percent of our funding come from uh, Australia, New Zealand, USA, France, and uh, actually the European Union is a large fund of our programs. Um eighty percent of our money comes in the form of projects, and twenty percent come from um, assessed uh, contributions from our members. Why is this important? It's important because project funding that comes to SPC comes with a predetermined purpose. You are to use this quantum of money to deliver these outputs in these countries. So as Director General, I say, yes, sir, 
and I report back to them. I have very limited ability to say, actually, my priorities and the priorities of our region are over here. So the fact that we have most of our money come to us in the form of project funding is a major, major challenge for SPC because it's spoken for well before it gets to us. And we have very limited ability to change this. Of course, we can influence it by negotiation, but pretty much it's determined by the funder. This is why I cheekily made reference earlier to who he who call, pays the piper uh, calls the tune. And the 20% that I have, 20 to 25% that I have, that comes from the assessed, uh, from the member contributions, is that every member pays a fee. Uh, it's, it's actually, again, all, all pretty much spoken for, because that's what I use to keep the lights on. And so, like an, for an organization like SBC, expected to do, um, to provide development support to many of our members, our ability to be influential to address the priorities as we determine them to be is seriously compromised. Of course, we try to negotiate with our funders, we try to influence, we try to provide the evidence to show that the priorities are elsewhere. But project funding means that the purpose for which we get the money, who benefits from that money, the amount of money involved, et cetera, is predetermined. So in fact, if you think about it, we have a governance arrangement made up of 26 members, a management executive, which effectively provides oversight for the 20% of our budget. It is somewhat um, a little odd, I think. Uh, in an ideal world, all of the money that comes to SBC should be flexible and SBC and the members determine how that money should be allocated. So that way we can truly allocate the money to the priorities and above all we can resource innovation. You see the problem with project funding and the way we're funded is that we're pretty much sticking with the status quo. I have very little ability to be truly innovative in addressing the development challenges of our region. So it's a major challenge for us at SPC and one that we try to address uh, with our funders. Here's another example. When I joined SPC, we were the regional um, manager of money from the Global Fund for TB, Malaria and HIV AIDS. The way the thing was structured, it was such that I decided that the financial risks to SBC were such that it was not sensible and we stopped it. Um, but the point is, there is this global fund to fight TB, malaria, and HIV AIDS. These are not priority disease conditions in our region. HIV AIDS, uh, AIDS yes, it's an issue in Papua New Guinea. Uh -huh. But essentially, despite the uh, dire predictions of 15, 20 years ago, it remains a low prevalence region. <laughs> HIV AIDS hasn't decimated the Pacific populations that people have us believe 10 years ago. In other words, it remains a low prevalence activity, low prevalence uh, risk, except uh, Papua New Guinea and maybe French Polynesia. Equally, TB is a problem in Papua New Guinea and RMI and a few places. It's not a, a, a widespread problem in our region. And the same with malaria. And in fact, Vanuatu, lesser extent Solomons, have done a great job reducing the malaria risk in those countries. So these conditions are not what, of course they're important, and, and particularly to those who are affected by this. But in an overall situation, they're not what I would regard as priorities for spending. I'd rather have some money to deal with childhood diarrheal diseases, with diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. But as I say, uh, there isn't a regional 
or a global fund to fight NCDs, despite the fact that it's a global problem, a global problem, not just in the Pacific. And what we have at the moment by way of resources for preventing and controlling diabetes and heart disease is grossly inadequate. And those, some of you might have heard me say, it's like using a, a canoe paddle to turn the Titanic. That's about the size of it. And despite our best efforts, we are not making traction with the development uh, partners around the world. The Pacific seriously needs some resources to address childhood obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Because I've shown you what happens to life expectancy as a result of these conditions, and it's bound to get worse. Uh, and, and I think we need to look at this uh, seriously. Uh, water. As I said to you, it's very difficult to source clean water in our region. And, you know, it's a major, region, a major problem in our region. In Fiji, only half the population have access to sustained clean water. And this uh, slide shows you sanitation and water, the bottom, um, uh, um, what do you call it? The bottom line shows the Pacific and the top shows the rest of the world. So if you look at sanitation, it's uh, static between 2000 and 2015, right? We're not making progress. We're not improving people's access to basic sanitation, people. We're not talking about, you know, anything particularly challenging. And if you look at water, access to clean water, in fact, it looks like it's uh, going backwards. And clean water is such a basic requirement, human need. And for some reason, development partners are not interested in funding. We have a little bit of resource to help countries with access to clean water. It's not sexy. There isn't a global fund to improve access to clean water. Somehow it doesn't, doesn't have the appeal of, uh, I don't know, something else. But you see, the bulk of the childhood conditions, both mortality and morbidity in our region, particularly in Micronesia, is attributable to poor access to clean water. What we need in this region is some serious effort to try to improve access to clean water in a region where it's difficult at the best of times to source uh, clean water. And if you think about climate change, inundation is going to make things worse. And yes, I say, maybe I don't know, maybe we're not communicating uh, well enough. Uh, maybe we should start uh, some other way of trying to make the case to our development partners that our needs are not uh, anything particularly challenging, they're pretty basic, pretty basic uh, needs. So let me finish off uh, uh, by way of a couple of slides on, on, on a summary so we can have a discussion. Uh, all of the islands have development plans. They're fantastic uh, planning documents, all very sensible, all reflect their local needs. But unfortunately, a lot of them have very limited budgets, as you can imagine, and many rely on ODA for implementing these plans. So we have these great plans, uh, much of which remain unimplemented because there, there isn't the, the resource. And I guess that's the story of the region. And people have this perception that we get a lot of money in the regional organizations like SPC. We get about 6 to 7% of the total ODA. It's tiny. And I'd like to think that we do a pretty good job with the little that we get. Um, and I would suggest to you that Pacific Island countries and territories and regional organizations like ours are not really driving the regional agenda. We have some influence, but it's quite limited. You might disagree with me. Essentially, we are uh, influenced heavily by global priorities global decision-making and global uh, or regional funding decisions. 
We have a, a, a framework for Pacific regionalism. Nick McClellan knows a lot about it. He can give you chapter and verse. Uh, it's, a good it's a good development. It's a good blueprint, but I think it lacks uh, detail in, in critical areas to truly be able to influence the development agenda in our region. Um, I should repeat the fact that most commentators tell me that we are making progress in the fisheries area that the, fish, the tuna fisheries in our region is by and large among the better managed uh, resource uh, around the world. And unfortunately, as I say, the small island developing states of our region have very limited resources for development and as such will remain vulnerable to influences from the outside. Thank you very much. It's an interesting uh, question. We, uh, in order to receive European Union money, we have to go through what's called a seven pillar assessment. Do we have reliable governance arrangements in place? Do we have good financial systems? Are we accountable and transparent? Da 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 da. And I can tell you that we've uh, passed uh, that. Um, and most donors have some similar system. Uh, so when you ask uh, me about trust, it would seem to me that the whole point about those uh, processes around assessing the uh, capability, the transparency, accountability, and all of that of an organization should at least tell you that uh, we are a transparent and accountable organization. Secondly, I can tell you that SBC has had 21 years of a clean audit from an independent outside auditor. We operate internally what's called an audit and risk committee who report independently to our board. I might try and suggest to the chair that you may want to word this differently and he says, go away, Colin, I'm writing my report independently. In other words, there are sufficient checks and balances in place, but it still doesn't change. I don't know how development partners make decisions. I've been this, in this job now six years, and I've been saying the same thing about water, <laughs> about diabetes for six years. Maybe I'm not not an effective communicator. Um, I don't know how development partners, um, what's important. I can tell you that the New Zealand Reset uh, Program has been helpful for us because the New Zealand government has then said, has, has issued the priorities for us are economic activity supporting women and young people, uh, climate change, when that happens, at least we can tailor our funding bids and conversations with them. And, and we've been moderately successful with the New Zealand government. It's not always uh, clear, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's not an exact science. It's not as if you make the case with sound evidence and they'll say, yes, Colin, very good, here's... X amount of money. It's a, it's a negotiated process, if you like, and it's based on a number of things. Is it, is it a priority for the funding country? Uh, has the Pacific leaders deemed it to be a regional priority? Is this organization the best organization from a, a delivery or risk uh, management point of view? So it's complicated, I know that. Uh, but as I say, Issues like clean water, to me, are so, so basic, and it's been pretty difficult 
to make progress on getting some resource. And you might be wondering, well, why is he talking about development partners all the time? A lot of small island states put their own money into some of this stuff, but it's never enough. I mean, their budgets are tiny. And if you look at health services, for example, it, 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 it's not adequately funded. Um, and they are challenged to balance these uh, requirements, uh, you know, health and education and all of those sorts of things. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a clean answer for you, but that's the nature of the game, I guess. So, yeah, it's not so much that, it's I, actually, I wasn't sure what you meant. yeah, it's not so much that, uh, it, it, it's more basic than that. Yeah. When you destroy crops, Tara takes nine months from planting to harvest. So a lot of the staples in the region take time. And when it's damaged, people turn to something else. And guess what that is? rice and flour and noodles. Um, so that, that's what I, I, I mean. And we try to work, uh, we've tried to communicate with the World Food Program, for example, because that's what they use for disasters. I understand why, but it's not the best thing if you're trying to encourage populations to return to their traditional uh, diets. Look, the pressure is on in the region. It's far easier, and people get more mileage out of a bag of rice and flour than taro because taro is more pe uh, perishable and it takes longer to produce. When you have a, a destruction of inshore fisheries environment, your catch will decline and people will turn to tinned fish. There's nothing magical at all. It's just that we used to talk about climate change and NCDs like two different things. Well, they're not. And, and increasingly, people are trying to make the connection. Uh, and, and, uh, and well before people get into the sort of personal stress uh, management issues that you referred to, I'm just talking about access to food, food security issues uh, that are associated uh, with, uh, with climate change. And, and I made mention... I think the coral bleaching problem is real. And uh, if we don't look out for the coral reefs, we have a problem because that's what people rely on for food. I have to say that climate change it was a little hard it was a little hard to hear you and I'm not oh, sure that I heard I, it all. Um, I got a mic now I can Yeah, oh yeah, that's better. Okay, so I just wanted to get your insights. Uh, you were talking about sort of the influence from outside on the regional agenda. So the current regional agenda is expressed through Boy. Uh, are you able to give us some insights as to whether that was driven more from outside forces, outside powers? Uh, donors, etc., or was that something that was prompt uh, that came through more from the Pacific Island governments themselves to make climate change the number one existential threat, as they say in Boy? I have to say that I think the Pacific Island leaders have done a tremendous job on climate change. I don't say that about all of the challenges that we face. I'm a little 
disappointed they haven't really picked up the stuff on water, for example, as much as I would like them to. But on climate change, you have to give you have to give it to the Pacific Island leaders. You know, in Paris in 2015, we all the whole world went uh, to Paris to to sort out the agreement, and nobody gave the small island states a chance of getting anywhere. But they they did. They made a, a, a big impact on the contents of uh, the Paris Agreement um, and subsequent uh, related uh, activities and meetings. So I do think that the Pacific Island leaders, the Pacific region, has had a major contribution towards, the, uh, uh, towards climate change and its uh, um, uh, current uh, status. And in fact, uh, I think Tulepa, Prime Minister of Samoa, made a good point when he referred to people elsewhere in the world who continue to deny climate change as being uh, somewhat unwell. Um, in other words, I think the Pacific Island leaders and the Pacific region have done a tremendous job on climate change to, to raise it to the level that it is even in the absence of support from some very influential parties, uh, as you know. So I think they've uh, made a huge splash on this and they continue to lead this. You see the continuing work to do with SDG 14, Life Below Water, about oceans and ocean health is again something that has been driven and led by, um, well, the Pacific uh, Island leaders uh, have made a, a contribution. I, I think the uh, Pacific ambassadors of the small island states uh, based in New York uh, have done a good job, I think. Good luck, uh, Colin, for your address today. You've raised uh, very critical issues about the Pacific, and I appreciate that. And um, I guess at the end of the day, the pretty girl or the pretty woman that you alluded to earlier had not been treated well or romantically as one expects. My, um, <laughs> the question that I have is, you know, the accessibility to sanitation and water is, um, is urgent and it's troubling. So uh, how does that feature in the, you know, the, the, the Millennium Development Goals that are sort of articulated by the United Nations? Does that help at all? Is that part of the, you know, development, uh, the Millennium Development Goal to ensure that, uh, you know, people of the Pacific Islands have accessibility to these two most important basic needs? And that's the first question. The second one is um, with regard to climate change. You know, I think um, as an academic, the climate change, and, as they, and I'm sure everyone has this observation as well, and that is it has become an industry, you know. There are important issues in the Pacific, like food security and, of course, accessibility to safe drinking water and others. But it has been, and of course, the Pacific Island governments have sort of politicized it and... Uh, have sort of blown it out of proportion to secure funding. And most of this funding do not really go into addressing, you know, food security and relocation and other important things, other critical things that have, you know, uh, resulted from climate change. Uh, I'm wondering if you can share your insights on that. Yeah. Well, your, your comment about the pretty woman, you know, like um, a lot of these things, uh, it, it generates uh, great expectations. Right, and it's uh, it's uh, fair to say that uh, the interest from outside global powers remains uncertain. We don't really know, and of course, you'll have your own views about the motivation for some of this. People um, often um, refer to China as the big bad guy which is making people interested in the Pacific and, and, and maybe that's so. But you know, China has been an, in the Pacific for a very long time and while people debate whether they should or they shouldn't, 
meanwhile, China is pushing ahead with uh, significant, significant development uh, activities around the region, and including Cooks and Yue. This is not just limited to Melanesia and so on. Uh, China is uh, is around the region. That's why I refer to the um, the interest from outside powers in the Pacific is is remains to be seen, shall we say. Uh, but without a doubt, the China factor uh, has come to play on this. I mean, this recent resurgence in interest uh, from uh, the, the, the major metropolitan players is sold pretty much around the issue of security concerns and so on. So it's a, I guess it's a story um, that uh, remains uh, incomplete and we'll see these things wax and wane, you know, uh, no, no doubt things will change. I can say for the New Zealand reset, uh, reset uh, uh, agenda, we've been able to secure additional resources for work in the region from that source. The Australian contribution, of course, is a little different. They talk about a billion dollars towards an infrastructure fund and so on. Uh, we are yet to see what the Americans are, are really on about. And, you know, then there's Japan and France uh, has made their own uh, interests uh, uh, known. So, as I say, it's just interesting because the interest in the Pacific, you know, gets heightened for some particular reason and then, it, you know, and then everybody else goes on to the next thing. Uh, so it's a bit un, unsure in my mind. Your, your point about water, um, there isn't an a SDG on water per se. They, they're in uh, pretty much other SDGs like poverty reduction, for example, and so on, but there isn't one on water as such, um, which I think has probably been an, an, an issue. Um, it, it didn't, water didn't get up as, a, as an issue in and of itself. I, I would have thought uh, that it's such a, an important issue around the world, you know, socially, economically, you know, water is so, so important, but uh, it doesn't, there isn't one on water alone, and the explanation is that it's covered elsewhere. SDG or not, I think the region, this region, there are very few places in our region w where people have, uh, where everyone has access to reliable, clean water. Most of our islands, and in parts of Papua New Guinea, less than one in five uh, persons have access to clean water. I, I just think it's such a big issue in our region, and we've tried to communicate this repeatedly, but somehow it doesn't get legs and I don't, I'm a little bereft as to why that is. But it has to be a huge uh, development challenge for our region, even in Fiji. Fiji is probably one of the most sophisticated of the small island states and they have the money. But you know, less than 50% of the people of Fiji get access to clean water. And I would have thought, and they've done some tremendous things. I'm not criticizing Fiji, but as I say, I'm just a little disappointed. Relatively speaking, water is so low down on the on the priority uh, list. Sorry, I talked so much, I've forgotten your third question. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure that I agree with that sentiment. I mean, yes, uh, it is, uh, it's relentless. I complained the other week uh, to my board about the number of meetings that we have to fund and attend related to the climate change issue. It just rolls on. Um, but beneath that, I think the resources that come through the climate change uh, facility, in our case, we use it to improve water. We use it to improve our seed bank in Suva, where we develop and distribute uh, saline-resistant seeds of the staples like cassava and so on. So as long as the resource is used to address the consequences 
of uh, climate change. I wouldn't, wouldn't quibble too much. But I do want to repeat about the fact that the, the whole uh, climate change uh, series of meetings have just become impossible to manage. Uh, accessing the funds related to climate change is an issue. And we recently got accredited uh, to be able to help member states access uh, the funds, like the Green uh, Climate Fund. So I don't, I'm not, I don't agree with your assessment of it being an industry because it depends on how the funds are used. I think. problem which is um, a non-resolved tension that you talked about where there are a number of pockets of young people particularly who are increasing numbers, Kiribati was one that you mentioned and the whole idea that there's no employment for them uh, and that's generally all through the Pacific as we, as we all know. Does neoliberalism help do that, or is there as an alternative way of being able to get young people employed, gainfully employed, but not under a neoliberal type philosophy? Well, I think the neoliberal ideology is uh, limits further the opportunities of young people. Now, if, in other words, if you use market principles, you're going to limit their opportunities even further. It seems to me that as supportive model between, say, the likes of ourselves and the countries into areas where uh, might be needed uh, in, the, in that community in a supportive way. It wouldn't meet the market test. So, for example, is there a, pool, a, a resource pool that SPC and others working with the countries to help young people into agriculture and food production or some similar activity. I know some might criticize that as a make work kind of arrangement, but an out and out market based approach to the development of young people is not what I think is needed. Somehow we've got to be much more creative about the things that appeal to young people that uh, can be supported with different funding models rather than, you know, relying on the kind of market principles that we're all familiar with. Uh, I just think we, we, we have a, a framework that we've developed with a number of the agencies around the region on the priorities for young people. But therein is another story which I didn't share with you. It's been virtually impossible to find the resources to do the work. So we say, oh, young people are the future of the Pacific, the future of our countries. It sounds, sounds really nice. But we have this uh, youth development framework that we've been able to, unable to resource uh, for three or four years. Sorry, I, I didn't want to leave this in an entirely pessimistic uh, end, right? Because there's some really good things happening in the region, I also believe that we have the potential for a high quality uh, of life in our region, but there are some challenges that we have to address, some of them at a very basic uh, level. But there's, as I say, there's some good things uh, happening in the region. I, was, uh, I wanted to share with you my frustrations at not being able to manage to match the resource requirements of a particular issue with the importance of that particular challenge uh, in our region. So as I say, I, I don't want you all leaving here feeling depressed from my presentation, but we do have some challenges that we must address. And I think if you can help uh, influence the people that you deal with, uh, I'm sure many of us in the Pacific would appreciate that. So I wish you all well. Thank you very much. Thank you.